Okay, great. Please go on. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Abbas. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the nice uh, introduction. As um, Ava said, I'm going to talk about my research on ecological networks. And as he said, that you are not maybe very familiar with, with the questions there, I will go slowly at the beginning. <laughs> and well, right now I'm doing a postdoc at uh, Dojena Biological Station. We did uh, is a research station for the Spanish Research Council in, in Seville, Southern Spain. And my group is actually very interdisciplinary. I'm not the only physicist there studying network, so it's, it's really good. And uh, what we are studying in my postdoc project is the temporal variability in those uh, ecological networks, which I think that temporal variability is something that you might be interested in. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay, so basically when I'm talking about interaction networks in ecology, I mean networks whose nodes are species and the edits are links that connect species that, for example, eat each other or uh, compete for our resources or just um, interact in a mutualistic way in the sense that for both of the species, that interaction is uh, positive. It's, it's good for both of them. For example, pollination is good for pollinators and for plants, flowering plants. And with this setting of in, uh, interaction networks, actually in ecology for the past decades, um, there have been a lot of interesting questions that has been addressed uh, in this framework. For example, ecological assemblage in the sense that how ecosystems came to be um, then the robustness to perturbation in those ecosystems that are very important is very important for coexistence and stability of those ecosystems, especially now with climate change. And then uh, from a more uh, anthropogenic point of view, um, ecological services like the amount of biomass of a forest and, and, and things like that can also be studied with uh, ecological networks. And Studying those networks, we have discovered some, some patterns, some similarities that, that are shared across a lot of different networks. So that means a lot of different uh, ecosystems, uh, biomes, regions. Um, one of them, for example, that uh, I'm going to, to, to talk more later is the diagonal dominance, this in the, in the left hand. So basically, it, uh, there is an intuition that for an ecological network to be stable, the intra-specific uh, interaction, which is the diagonal of the um, adjacency matrix of that network, which in ecological terms means the feedback of the species in itself. So this uh, AII, the interaction that a species that with itself, maybe in network science, we do not like loops, but in ecology, actually, they are quite important. And so that self-regulatory effect of the species in absolute value should be greater than the sum of the absolute values of the effects that other um, species do on that particular species. So the species self-regulate more than it's regulated by other species. And in that situation, it seems that the, the ecological networks are more stable or more robust. And then the, we have also discovered, well, it has also been discovered, I didn't do it, but anyway, other uh, patterns in the interaction, for example, the nested net structure or the traffic coherence, modularity, you might have heard about them. And then regarding how the strengths of the interactions um, are distributed, in the, the matrix, mm, there are some hypotheses that have not been really tested yet. And, and one of them is the stress, stress gradient hypothesis but, uh, by Maestre et al. With basically, it's for me at the beginning, it was a little bit counterintuitive. So basically, it says that, OK, uh, we have an ecological community that is very stressed. It's a very harsh environment. So in that situation, the species tend to have more positive 
more mutualistic interactions. And if the environment is good, you have plenty of resources, then in that case, competition will be the dominant um, interaction. But at the beginning, it may seem a little bit strange, like, mm, but if it's a harsh environment, actually species should compete more for the little resources they have. Well, actually it's the opposite because they basically do not have enough strength to, to compete by anything. They just want to survive, <laughs> okay? And I will also come, come back with this, uh, this concept. So, however, because there is also a however, if not, we, we wouldn't be here <laughs> basically, uh, for all these studies of uh, in interaction networks and ecology, the parameters of the network, so every element of the interaction matrix, is considered a fixed uh, property of the of the ecosystem. So, uh, for example, actually, if we have a um, pollinator community, the flowers do not bloom all at the same time and the pollinators are not always there. So actually what we have is just a temporal overlapping of flowers and, and pollinators. But at the end of the day, we study that with a time aggregated network. But in reality is not the case. What we have in reality is a, a, a collection of snapshots of interactions. So during the recent years, it has been an, an effort to actually disentangle these uh, interactions. And instead of having one single network, to have several of, of them. But um, I know that in other um, fields, uh, this is something that has been um, doing uh, for quite a lot of, a long time, not here in, in ecology, actually, but it's very important because since maybe the temporal variation of the interactions may change due to extreme climate event, the first step to try to mitigate uh, those um, events are actually understanding how the interactions are changing. And in this line, we have some recent, recent works of um, studying the interaction rewiring, that is when one species reconnect with um, other species, and also the, the effect of species uh, turnover. So when one species basically uh, disappeared of the, of the ecosystem, which is something that in ecology actually happens a lot because maybe it has to be sampled or maybe it has actually <laughs> disappeared. And, but in order to do these studies, we need uh, a lot of amount of data. And I was used to use just simulations. So I had my own synthetic data. I did uh, usually in the past in silico experiments, as some of you may, may do, or um, I was also using for other researchers, research um, Twitter data, which is quite abundant. And then I arrived to ecology and <laughs> it seems that there, there is, uh, um, a scarcity of data. It's very little data and not very time resolved. So, oh, sorry. So for, so so, so basically I, I want you to, to, to take into account and to remember that uh, in order to study temporal variability in ecology, the, um, the field work, the, the empirical work that is needed is a lot, a lot of human energy and money to, to do it. Um, yeah. And a part of the <laughs> amount of work that we, we need to do, uh, there are also some, some problems that are that we actually do not know why the interactions are changing. So we have some hints, uh, of course, that there might be two main uh, drivers of temporal variability. One of them is uh, human behavior. For example, uh, in agricultural landscapes, the human factor there is, is of course, uh, undeniable. 
And then we have other abiotic factors like the phenology, which is the, the study of the times at which uh, species are active, and traits, and um, precipitation, temperature, all these, um, all these things. Um, so we would, so if we actually know, if we have a super good data, temporal data of the abundances and interactions of the species, and we actually know uh, what are the drivers that are changing those interactions, we can really increase and improve the knowledge of uh, our ecosystem. So instead of having one single network, we have a collection of networks. It time, it, each time a step, we will have a network. And this is precisely what I'm going to, to explain you, how to obtain these networks, and then, of course, how to characterize uh, these networks in terms of uh, interesting ecological questions, OK? And finally, I, a part of disentangle what is the driver, how the interaction is the interaction network is changing. We would also like to know whether those changes are deterministic. So they are always going to be the same if precipitation decreases because, um, because of climate change, for example, and we have a, a, a drought, uh, the system is always going to react the same or the reaction, the effect is going to be a stochastic. Uh, what weights more, a stochasticity or um, a deterministic uh, driver? We will see. Um, well, here I was explaining a little bit what is our deterministic process, but uh, well, I think that is quite self-explanatory. So I will skip these two slides and uh, do a little recap of what um, I will uh, show you today. So basically, I'm going to characterize to obtain and characterize the temporal changes of um, the networks of species interactions, disentangle the stochasticity part and the deterministic part. And then, of course, uh, why we're doing this? Well, um, in order to understand how emerging properties of the ecosystem, in this example, the stability, changes through time due to the changes of the uh, species interactions networks. In order to do this, I'm going to use basically two data sets that are in for southern Spain, but um, data set one and data set two that we know that the driver, that a possible driver of um, this change in the interaction network is precipitation. So my, my team during the last 10 years uh, has done the incredible effort to sample every year uh, and they have obtained a lot of data for different sites within plots within the data set. These are the red lines. So, so, so basically, we have quite a amount of data that, that varies a little bit uh, through through the plots. So we have we know that we have uh, species that are affected by precipitation, and we also have some what I call local contingency that are these stochastic effects due to the fact that we have different um, different sites, different um, sites in which the species has been uh, sampled. And um, so now a little bit of uh, on the methods. I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, LV, lot Cavolterra equations. So basically there are equ equations to um, study the uh, growth of uh, the abundances of species through time. And they are mainly composed by two terms. One is called the intrinsic growth, which is the growth a species I would have alone, let's say. And then uh, this sum over here, uh, can you see my pointer? Yes. OK. <laughs> uh, this term here, that is uh, basically the adjacency matrix of the interaction. So it's the effect of uh, other species onto our species. But now here, we have added these uh, two extra terms, uh, PT, with P goes for precipitation. So basically, here we are saying that the precipitation uh, is also playing some role on the evolution of the abundances of species. 
in this case, the, the effect we have supposed that is linear because it's the simplest things to do. And, and basically, uh, these four terms are deterministic in the sense that every year, every time t, the effect is going to be the same. But we have also added a, a random effect that is due to these different plots in which uh, we are sampling. Okay, this is something. This is mm, some technical detail, but basically we have like two terms, uh, one collection of deterministic terms that some of them depends on time, and others that are random. And we have used a linear mixed model to um, try to fit all these parameters, which actually are a lot, but I have done test, for example, with the Akai K criterion to see whether I was overfitting or not. Uh, yeah, uh, don't worry. <laughs> and, and, and basically, uh, what we would like to know is if uh, the interactions vary every year. So if this term that depends on the precipitation that varies every year is uh, greater than zero, <clears throat> and then how the interacts, the intrinsic growth, uh, which are those terms, also vary every year. Uh, yes, here you have it. Um, I have uh, worked with several models, just deleting some terms. And, and yeah, I mean, you can be uh, confident uh, to, to say that um, the, this is not overfitting. <laughs> OK, so in terms of uh, interactions, instead of having one um, matrix of interaction, one network, we have several of them. We, we have a baseline. Of, uh, of, a, of a matrix uh, AIG of um, in adjacency matrix. And every year it's added to uh, this uh, other matrix uh, BIA times the precipitation. So if precipitation changes, then the, the interaction is, uh, matrix is going to change. And these changes are not negligible in the sense that actually the, the, there is variation. And how is this variation? Well, uh, first we have looked in this collection of networks and we have just uh, uh, done some histogram of the weights of uh, each uh, element. And through time, which is the i-axis, so we are going up, uh, we see that um, we have a decrease in competition and uh, increase in mutualism. So decrease competition, increase uh, mutualism uh, through time. And especially uh, this coincides in time with the period in which precipitation was very, very low. So in terms, so in ecological terms, that means that the results are coherent with the stress gradient hypothesis. So when the environment is very harsh because there is no water, basically, then the mutualism increases. With, uh, we were pretty happy with these uh, results, actually. And then regarding the uh, topology of the networks in the sense of um, yes, zeros and ones, uh, zeros and non-zeros, we use this measure of um, the interaction persistence over, over time developed by some colleagues in, in Spain also that is called temporality. So actually, it's a kind of Jacquard index. So basically it's a one minus the intercept of the sets of um, networks into time, in the in, uh, links into time set uh, divided by the union. So the common and uncommon links in, in these two networks. So basically if the temporality is zero, that means that the intersection and union of links is the same. So uh, the networks are exactly equal. And um, if uh, the temporality is one, that means that the networks are completely different because there is no intersection between the links at one time and the links in another time. And well, for this particular work, I have uh, generalized, well, not generalized, but I have modified a little bit the this uh, measurement. So I'm working with positive links and negative links. And um, what we obtain, so here in the i-axis is the temporality, the positive temporality and the um, difference of precipitation. So basically the precipitation difference modify not only 
the um, weights of this uh, interaction network, but also the uh, structure in the sense that some links appear and other links disappeared. Okay. And, and finally, uh, we have this uh, diagonal dominance that is related to, to stability. And we, we have, um, if it's greater than zero, let's say that uh, it's, it's better because it's more stable. And um, we have found for these two data set, one and two, a concave form. So um, basically there is a, 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 a medium, um, Good diagonal dominance that coincides coincides with the typical precipitation values of our ecosystem. So when we have extreme precipitation values, the diagonal dominance is very bad. And we were also pretty happy with this because uh, it's pretty coherent with all the theoretical understanding that we had of um, static uh, networks. Then regarding the stochasticity and deterministic contributions. Um, basically, um, doing an R squared that can be divided in these two uh, terms, uh, we found that there is a stochasticity, which is usually less than the, term the deterministic uh, factor, and this is very strange. In well, very strange. In in ecology, they are usually equal, or even the stochasticity term is greater in the sense that uh, we have all noise. But since the data set was, was pretty long, uh, we could get better um, results. And then finally, uh, okay, we have well, characterized um, a collection of, of networks through, through time, and we want to see how these affect stability. And in order to do that, um, we are going to use, I mean, in ecology, there are like 40 measurements of stability. They got crazy about how to measure stability, uh, but there is one that is very suitable and convenient for our approach of or temporal approach, which is the structural stability approach. That actually can also be used for any other dynamics, not only ecological ones. So, so basically, it, uh, this interaction depends both on the interaction of the, on, on the matrix of interactions and on the growth rates of the, of the species. And what it tries to do is to see uh, the maximum amount of variation in these uh, intrinsic growth rates that the system is able to tolerate, to tolerate until one species go, go extinct. So, the, the so in in ecology we are interesting interested in states in which all species are alive, which makes sense. That is called feasible solutions, and we are also interested in okay. Now we know that these um, that all the interactions and the growth rates of the interaction the species are actually varying how then this feasible solution is going to change depending on the, on the variation. So this approach allows us to, to, do, to do it. Um, so basically, um, in this uh, approach, we have this white region, which is the feasibility domain in which whatever the growth rate of the species, if it's here, the all the species are going to coexist. And if it's out, one or more will die. And uh, the shape of this white region is given by the adjacency matrix of interactions. And then the, the growth rate is R, which is the sum of the deterministic precipitation stochastic terms that we have needed previously. So this R is basically the blue arrow. So we have basically tracked how this arrow, arrow was, was moving through time. Okay, and now um, this is a little bit scary, but uh, this example was with two species. And when we increase the dimensionality of the system, we end up with a sphere and some um, more difficult 
um, geometry to, to visualize. But I mean, I think it's not necessary to you to understand um, everything of this picture. Basically, uh, the, the, the thing that I want you to remember is that our measure of stability this is going to be the, the distance from the main, the medium um, arrow, for example, here of the, of the, the, the center of the visibility domain. So the distance from the center of the visibility domain to our vector of growth rates. So this um, arrow here that says deviation, okay? In 3D, it will be the distance between the plus sign and the X, the red X, okay? And what if we have a time? Okay, um, basically here we have the distance for several plots, several sites, and uh, the stars are the mean of, of those differences. And um, it seems that when the values of precipitation are in the here in the center, which are the typical good values for our environment that, that we know from the past, then the distance to the center of the visibility domain is very small in the sense that it allows to, to, more, to more perturbations. So we say that the system is more stable when it's in its optimal temperature. And when the temperature values, the temperature, sorry, precipitation, and when the precipitation values go to some extreme, both law of rain or no rain at all, in that situation, we move farther and farther from the center of our feasibility domain, which means that we approach to some of the age. So we approach uh, a state in which some species may go extinct. So the stability of the system decreases, um, which um, it's, it's pretty coherent in, in the sense that uh, the system should be adapted to the precipitation values that are typical for, for it. And basically it's 20, Okay, I have been talking for almost 30 minutes as I, I was told me that these talks were more or less 30 minutes long. So, and I think that I have given you a good amount of information. So if you agree, we can left it uh, here. Mm. So basically the, the take home message of this long study with a lot of new <clears throat> methodology, both for the ecological community and, and, and for you, is that the interaction network do vary through time, both in extremes and in, in sign. And um, with our approach, we are able to disentangle the the amount of variance explained by stochastic uh, events and by deterministic uh, factors. And then the variation of the interaction network actually is very coherent with the ecological theoretical predictions of the past decades. For example, the diagonal dominance, the stability, or the stress uh, gradient hypothesis. And yeah, basically that's, that's all. I guess that you will have some, some questions, so happy to answer them. Very nice talk. I really like your visualizations. Thank you. Uh, so, question. Hey, so thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, about the Lotka Volterra model, so, so trying to trying to figure out the different parts in there. So you have the term AIJ, which is like the baseline, right? And it's fixed. So it, it is a static thing. It's true all the time. It's kept fixed. And yes. also BIJ, the term itself is fixed, is it? It is. Yeah. So I mean, that the... matrix is, is constant. And then you just multiply it by the precipitation, right? Yes. But the thing is that so what is constant is the effect of precipitation 
that is B A E on the matrix. But that uh, effect, that, that, that term is quite small. So when it's multiplied by the precipitation uh, compared to A A E can be can be for the same uh, magnitude or not. So mm. so basically um Okay, so 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 basically, since the no, ah, I cannot show it because it's skipped. Okay, so 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 basically, if we have this a a i g plus b a i times p d t, so this is a line, and we will have some p critical in which the sign of the uh, realized interaction will will Good. will vary. So so hmm. at the end of the day, depending on the value of precipitation we do have some um, interactions that are actually zero. Okay, good. So so basically, so if I would look at, at a single interaction, then I could hmm. kind of think that, that it's a bit like just a sort of linear fit in that, that AIJ gives you, that's like the intercept, right? And then the, the sort of linear term that varies with Precipitation is is B I J, so so that gives you okay. So this is, and and then you fit fit the matrices using the whole timeline, right? So how do you how do you plug the data into this? Yeah. Okay. So we we use um a technique called generalized linear mix model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what it allows us is to group uh, the species in the plots in which they have been measured. And we so, so so basically for every species in each of our data sets, it will have the same um, ri, ri prime, a and, and b, and then it will be a stochastic term that yeah. depends on the plot of that species. Okay. So yeah, we are adding the stochasticity just in the growth rate. But actually, I have also developed other model that is over here, here, in which there is, uh, in which depends on the, um, for each row in a, my adjacency matrix, I have some uh, stochastic term, and the res the uh, qualitatively, the results do not change. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. So in this model, is it kind of, uh, can you justify that this, this uh, growth rate, both the uh, like self-regulating ones and the interruption term, they are both linear uh, with, uh, with the precipi precipi precipitation? Um, is it, so if you, for example, um, if you don't have the PT term, uh, like the term that is proportional to PT, and if you uh, um, fit this model um, year by year, then you will have this RI up term and AIJ term for each year, right? And then if you um, plot that against PT, would it be linear? Yeah, okay. It's true that since it's linear, I mean, I, I guess that what, what, what you are saying to me that uh, it should be saturating. No, no, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I'm just wondering if if it's kind of like a um right assumption to to assume that this is linear to precipitation. Okay, so um, I mean, the short answer is that it's not in the sense that, of course, if the precipitation increases tenfold, mm -hmm. uh, the system is not going to react linearly. Of course, but uh, we thought that within the range of precipitations that we know that are uh, real uh, realistic mm, it kind of it kind of works and also then we were limited by the the number of parameters and data that we we had in the sense that mm -hmm. if we wanted to satur to to create a saturating or a sigmoid uh, function with precipitation then we, we would need more parameters and we would need to know when uh, this saturation is, is going to happen. So we basically say, okay, 
we are not going to add more parameters to our model. But uh, yes, um, I, I mean, um, regarding this uh, linearity, uh, okay, so basically uh, here for the, not for the inter uh, intrinsic growth rate for the Rs, but for the um, elements of the realized matrix, we have this uh, linear uh, dependence and we have this PC in which it changes um, um, the sign. And basically this PC um, more is mostly on realistic values of the precipitation. So at the end of the day, we are moving very near the uh, horizontal axis. The x axis. So I so 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 we are not so. I mean I think it's it's okay to to do it for our yeah. ranges of precipitation. Yeah. As a first order approximation, I think that's very like reasonable assumption. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions. If, if, well. I have a short question. I think it's just about the what's the time resolution in your modeling uh, or in your data like. Uh, yeah, yeah. This would be point processes, but I think you are looking at certain time slots are like uh, what's the time interval that you index time it's, here? It's yearly, so I have ten data points actually, but then uh, a lot for the the plots and uh, during each year, um, it has been the precipitation has been measured uh, six times. So yeah, that's the, the mostly mostly um, when I um, do these uh, these plots, I'm always sum for the for the year, which is what is useful for them, the precipitation each year. Um. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I'll just move here so that it doesn't blur your face anymore. No, it's... Oh, okay. can you repeat it? <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, when, uh, so um, you said that there is this diagonal of dominance, right, for the typical precipitation range. Um, and um, so I was wondering, so when you move out from this typical pre precipitation range, um, if you actually look at the um, the absolute values of diagonal elements and like of diagonal elements, is it so that diagonal elements decrease or the of diagonal of diagonal elements increase? Which both which, both okay both so, yes okay mm -hmm. um, and then so when you move on from this typical precipitation range, um, so in in this. An intermediate regime, you have this diagonal dominance, but when you move out from this like uh, uh, this range, um, when you uh, have uh, like very little rain, then the interruption gets neutralistic, right? Yes. And then if you move to the other side, then interruption gets more competitive. So it's no, also mutualistic. So yes. both. Uh... They are both extremes, so mm -hmm. I mean more water is not always better. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah, but then does that affect the dynamics of the result of an opera or like the interaction between? So like you move out from this uh, stable region, but in a different way, right? If when you go left or right, so how does that affect the system's dynamics? Uh, wow. Well, actually, I have well, I have not tried to really uh, run the, the the simulation. I have just studied the if it's what you are. Yeah. So, for it? example, I mean, intuitively, if all the interactions are mutualistic, the system might be more stable than all the interactions are like more competitive. That's kind of my intuition, but I might be wrong. So I'm just kind of wondering. Mm, okay. Happen there. Mm. Okay, so maybe it's better with this graph. Okay, so um, actually, I in my data I have uh, at the beginning of uh, the years, the values of precipitation are. Mm, 
the typical ones, and then a bad period of uh, drought uh, appears, okay? So I know how the, inter the matrix change from typical values to, to drought in the sense that, so the mutualistic terms become bigger, basically. And um, then I have uh, uh, two points in some values that are not really uh, typical, but since it's just one matrix, I do not know actually how the matrix would change for a uh, big uh, values of precipitation empirically. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I could just put a very large value of, of precipitation and, and see how it changes. But uh, yeah, um, empirically, I do not have a period of a huge amount of precipitation. So okay. cannot tell for, from the empirical side. Mm -hmm. But would it be also interesting to do simulations like numerical simulations, assuming some kind of model and see what happens, like what kind of differences you would have for this like left region and right regions? Yeah, definitely. Thank you for pointing it out. Yes. I'm going to. Um, okay. <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very nice having you. Hope to see you soon. I don't know if you're coming to CCS this year or not. But are you? Yeah, I, I don't know yet if I'm going to go to Exeter. But okay. uh, or you, what, what, what you were saying? No, I was just asking if you are going to CCS. See, yeah, I don't know. I don't know yet. But okay. uh, I hope so. I have sent some uh, contributions that have been accepted. Now, mm -hmm. you know, I just have to uh, obtain money <laughs> to go. Oh, yeah, that I understand. Um, okay. Will you be there? I hope so. <laughs> I need a visa as well. So like it's a bit mm -hmm. more complicated. But yeah, I'm trying my best with Takayuki to join you and hope to see you. All the best and uh, enjoy the sun. OK, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Bye-bye. Likewise. Bye.